Okay, greetings everyone. You're welcome to the part two of our lectures on gases. So this is the part two. This is the last of the lecture. You don't have. You're not going to have any part after this. So let's just get right into it. So in the first part, we talked about a lot of things. We're going to just continue with calculation on pressure, volume, amount, and, or temperature. So you're doing either, if you're trying to find what pressure is, you're trying to find what volume is, you're trying to find what amount is, or you're trying to find what temperature is, and note that the rest is going to be given, or they're going to tell you whether it's constant. So in this type of problem, one of the state variables is not known. So one of them is not known and you find the unknown using the formula that we know. So this is done by direct substitution into the ideal gas law. Your ideal gas law is your PV equals to NRT. So you take care of the following units through the calculation. So you have to ensure that the units are the standard units. Don't use degree Celsius. Don't use other units that you know it will give you a wrong answer so so that's for that then we have an example here in this example you have sulfur hexafluoride and this is a gas used as a long-term tamponade which is a plug for your retinal hole to repair detached retinas in the eyes so this is this is in biomedical engineering where you have this um gas that is used to help in the tampon it that this just written out the holes in the eyes what they do is like a filling to to damp the blood and block and so that the bleeding doesn't occur or escape of fluid doesn't occur so they use that gas to help the whole treatment procedure so if 2.50 grams of this compound is introduced into an evacuated 500 milliliter container at 83, 83 degrees Celsius. What is the pressure in atmosphere? What pressure in atmosphere is developed? So now we are given certain parameters and we are asked for pressure. And the pressure particularly is asked for in atmospheres, not um, parts per, um, pounds per square inch, not bar not pascal not any of the other not not any of the other units but in atmospheres so we put together what we have been given which is your milliliter which is the mass which we're going to combat use the mass and find the mole so all of those things are what we and then we know what our gas constant is so having everything and having converting your milliliter to liter and your degree celsius to kelvin you get right into it, substituting the things you have into the formula PV equals the NRT. So, so doing that, you have your 500 milliliter. Actually, it's just half of a liter, and half of a liter is 0 0.5, and one liter is 1,000. So half of a liter is 500. So you have that 500 milliliter, and then 83 to Kelvin is just adding 273 to 83, and then you have 356. And having that to convert your mass to moles, we know how it do you, how it happens. You divide it, you divide the mass by the molar mass, and on dividing that, you have your zero point. And your molar mass is you remember the compound given is your sulfur hexafluoride, meaning that you have your sulfur and then multiply it by and add multiply six by the mass of fluorine and add it to that of sulfur that's how you get your 146.09 gram 07 grams so once you do that multiplication you have the mole and then you put it into the formula which will just simply mean you dividing nrt by the volume which is 0 0.5 liters and then you find that your answer is 1 atm 1 atm so that's how easy that question was of which something that could be solved by you as we go further i'll get you to pause the video and do the preceding exercise that we're going to see ahead of us so we're doing something very interesting in the next in this particular we're, we're doing a derivation kind of of a sort where we have our molar mass and then we have our density then we 
we, we, we look at them together and then we do a derivation that we'll see in the next slide. Density is equals to mass over volume. We remember this from previous um, lectures. It's mass over volume. And the molar mass is, has units of grams per mole. Your molar mass is mass over mole. Your molar mass is mass over mole. And in the ideal gas law, we know we have our moles, we have, um, have moles in there. And the moles is your N and it's expressed as and your moles from our knowledge that mass is equal to molar mass times mole when you divide both sides by the molar mass you have that molar mass your mole is equal to mass over molar mass so given that we substitute that into the gas law so there's a relationship so there's a relationship that volume has with that to so substitute that into the 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 the, the, the ideal gas law so it's going to be PV is equal to mass over molar mass, your gas constant, and your temperature. So when you do that, you want to actually extract density from, you want to extract that because density is mass over volume. The goal is that you're trying to extrapolate and make out the formula from the ideal gas law, given the fact that mode, just finding the relationship, the, the term, the fact that mole relates with um mole relates with um sorry moles relates with your your volume in the basis of what the units are because volume um, density is mass over um, is mass over volume and then mole is mass over molar mass hence you're trying to make out density from the relationship and what you simply what will simply happen is that if you want to do it very quickly, just take this molar mass to this end and bring volume to this end and you have that unit. You have that unit that you want here. But it will not work out because you want the unit to equal this. You want the density to be equal to this whole thing happening here. Of which, if density is equal to mass over volume, if you get mass of which the way we can do it simply i'm trying to work it out so that you can be able to understand how they got um molar mass in, the product of molar mass over the ratio of the pressure over your gas constant and temperature i'm trying to make you graphically see what i'm doing here what happens is that if you were to do it like this you you multiply both sides by rt or no divide both sides by rt no multiply both sides by rt divide both sides by rt when you divide both sides by rt you have rt disappearing from here and appearing here because that's the only way you can divide that's the only way you can move rt to here because if it's a product here you divide to bring it to the side if you have done that then you have to now move volume downwards and to move volume downwards you have to multiply both sides by molar mass and when you multiply both sides by molar mass you have p over rt multiplied by m m and that's how you get this thing that we see here because density is your mass over volume and it's also equal to your molar mass multiplied by your uh, multiplied by your pressure over your gas constant and temperature so density of a gas does depend on your pressure temperature and your molar mass and i don't know whether you those of you who are both observant are noticing the fact that formulas are very much um applicable in reality where the parameters that you're dealing with your formula remember we talked about pressure when we say pressure is force applied in a unit area i'm applying pressure on this part of my hand per unit area that is the, that is where the pressure this is this is where this is what actually feels the pressure but the result of the pressure felt is what is moving my hand the more the pressure the quicker the move so hence pressure is forced by unit area unit area you know i can be applying pressure that's how we measure pressure and that's how it is because it's based on the strength of force applied and force is very directional so that's out of the way then we see density of gases and it's very very weird because of what we just saw now where you have pressure you have temperature and you have molar mass and that is that is those parameters are very much dependent on this and you see that very much here where the balloon in the air is the only balloon 
that is filled with helium gas because helium gas is lighter than air hence the balloons on the floor are just filled with air density is what is at work and i say this to the student if you are doing ceremonies and you see a balloon going up and up in the air the balloons are filled with helium gas most balloons all the balloons filled with helium gas tend to be always suspended all those balloons you see people selling that are very much floating in the air all filled with helium gas and we know that helium gas also affects your voice as well and then what you see at the side is um the great reno um balloon race this happens this is a ceremony that happened i think in the united states and some other places and in fact it's a it's a global thing where people from different countries come and do the race with this balloon and the balloon is filled with what happens is that they, they use gases and they also use some yeah, and the gases are uh, also heat they they like it's like um um it's like your gas cooker they tend to fire the gases with some flames and everything then it fills up the the balloons and then it takes off and they have mechanisms to land it as well so it's literally it's literally a balloon race where people are inside there and they are moving from it actually moves they tend to direct direction and it's a wonderful thing you can check it up on youtube and and help yourself and feed your eyes and see how gas and it's basically remember we talked about um mass talked about pressure talked about how those things inversely relates to themselves and hence you can see it practical in this in this respect so we have another example of acetone and acetone has a density of 1.96 grams per liter which means mass over volume and at 95 degrees celsius and 1.02 atm so the question now is how many moles of acetone are there in one liter flux under these conditions so the question is moles the question is moles remember the formulas that we did that relates to this hence that was what we're going to employ so in the question we have volume of the flux we have temperature which will convert to kelvin we have the density and we have the grams and the grams is that of grams over liter though that's that's what it is so we, we ask for the moles so how we're going to do this is using the formula pv is equals to nrt so given using that formula we just put our 1.02 the volume which is one liter and then the gas constant we use the gas constant which we're very much familiar with which is 0 0.0821 and then the temperature which we have converted from degree Celsius to Kelvin and you have your answer there at 0 0.0338 mole so with that being done we now have another question and this question is it what is the molar mass of acetone what is the molar mass of acetone what is the molar mass of acetone and the solution is straightforward given the fact that we know that molar mass is equal to your mass over your number of moles your mass over your number of moles hence you have your mass which is 1.6 gram over the mole and then you have your answer as 58.0 grams per mole because the answer there is grams per mole so note the density is given which is the mass which implies that's the mass and because it's grams per volume and then you have all of those there and then that's your answer from there and then the c now says acetone contains three elements Notice that we're doing slightly some very interesting things from the past. Where we're doing mass related stuff and we're including gas stuff into it. And by the way, I don't know if you'd not realize acetone is basically your nail polish remover for the ladies. They know that very well. For the guys, you guys are just catching up to reality. So acetone is your nail polish remover. So um, here you go. So it has three elements which are carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And when 1.00 grams of acetone is burned, it's quite it's flammable as well. 2.27 grams of CO2 and 0.932 grams of H2O are formed. So the question is, what is the molecular formula of acetone? So hence, if you remember our percentage composition um, lecture, you tend to figure out where this is going. So hence you have the molar mass of acetone, you have the grams 
of two components or two and um, products of the reaction you have the of two product reaction and then we're going to try to work out that and first and foremost we convert the mass of the product because this what just happened is combustion and combustion is results in your co2 giving off and water also produced and I, I think I shared this when I was talking about your composition thing. When I was trying to explain something, I, think I shared this as well, where I discussed composition and um, combustion with the students. I don't know whether it was in class or in the video, but I can't remember. So now what happens is that you are going to do mass composition in a sense. You're going to do kind of that idea where you get the mass of CO2 and you know what the mass of carbon is. And then you do that in relations to co2 the mass of co2 itself and then you get out the mass because if 20 if 2 point if 2.27 grams of co2 is what to produce you want to have its relations to carbon to extract the amount of carbon the amount of carbons in particular where co2 is related you do that in the first part where you have co2 the molar mass of co2 down there and that of carbon then multiply through and then you get that the yeah, exact amount of carbon there that's the mass of carbon you do that for hydrogen as well using water because hyd hydrogen is present in water then you multiply the mass through to the two moles of hydrogen always don't play with the moles with the amount you have two hydrogen so you have to it has to be twice multiply that through you have the mass on the other side and 18 is your what 16 of hyd of oxygen and 1.008 of hydrogen that adds up to 18.02 then once you're done with that then you go for the adding the two masses together and minusing it from the main sample to get that of oxygen the reason why you're not doing that of oxygen is because oxygen is present in co2 and is also present in h2o hence the trick is to capitalize on that and take the masses of the two and then minus it to find the total from the amount of the sample that is given. That's a better trick because if you do for them individually, you might go into some error. So going with this is the perfect because you have carbon, hydrogen, then we minus to get that of um, oxygen from the mass, sample mass that is given or the mass of the sample that is given. So when you're done with that, this all should be familiar to you. We did that in, we did that previously where we were trying to find the empirical formulas. You get the mole by just dividing it by its mass and taking the smallest to find the numbers that occur. So you do that here where you have 0 0.619 divided by 12, you have the value. Do the same for oxygen you have the value do the same for hydrogen you have the value you take the smallest which is 0 0.170 which is that of oxygen and divide it by the rest so you discover that oxygen has one hydrogen has six carbon has three so obviously your simplest formula will be c3h6o and that is for that and then now to get the formula we will now multiply through and get our 58.08 like we're trying to get the, molec the, molec the mole molecular mass from the simplest formula and when we get that we we'll discover that from the last question we did where was that oh, no, a lot back yeah here remember that this happens to be our um, molecular mass and it ties into our answer just here so hence the simplest formula is equal to the molecular mass and molecular formula remember I told you from the last I said every simplest formula is a molecular formula but not every molecular formula is the simplest formula I said that before in passing or I did it in the class I can't remember where I say these things so now we move to stoichiometry stoichiometry in gas reactions so balance equations can be used to relate 
moles or grams of substances taking part in reactions. So the stoichiometry is just your balance, reactants, products, and you can use that to relate moles, you can use that to relate grams. So when gases are involved, the relations can be extended and include volume. So when you have gases, you can have volumes because remember, we so we can measure gases with volume, amount, pressure, temperature. So the first stoichiometric relationship was discovered to be discovered was the law of combining volumes. It's called the law of combining volumes. So it says in this law, it said volume ratio of any gas of any two gases in a reaction at, at constant temperature and pressure is the same as the reacting mole ratio. So the volume ratio is the same as the reacting mole ratio. And note that this reaction should be at constant temperature and pressure. Constant temperature and pressure mean that the temperature should be the same and the pressure should be the same as well. So uh, that is the law of combined volumes. So the moles ratio and the volume ratio will be the same and then constant temperature and pressure. So this is a flow chart for the stoichiometry calculation involving gases. So note your moles in A having everything of A and then the moles in the B. So hence your stoichiometric ratio should balance of the moles of A and the moles of B where on this side you have your mass of A over molar mass. You have your moles of parent which is your volume multiplied by your, your your mass your moles and then you have your p b over nrt which is your moles because your, your moles is equal to your pv over your nrt while in the other side you're relating it to either your pressure volume or temperature and then the moles and then you have your molar mass or mass at the top there notice that in this other part you're having your o's when you're trying to relate the ratios together so you have your example and in this example, you have hydrogen peroxide, and it's a bleaching agent. We remember from the previous where we talked about hydrogen peroxide as a bleaching agent, and the simplest formula of hydrogen peroxide being H and O. So it decomposes quickly in water and oxygen gas at high temperatures. So it decomposes quickly, and it gives you it gives off water and oxygen. It gives us water and oxygen. So how many liters? Of oxygen are produced at 78 degrees Celsius and 0.934 atmospheres when 1.27 liter of hydrogen peroxide which has a density of 1.00 grams per milliliter not just as milliliter that is used in this case and this is when it decomposes so we know that information given is temperature, pressure, volume, density, and we're required to find, as it stated, to find the amount and volume is produced. We actually find the amount and volume that's produced. So we're going to do that using what is given. So going into it, we change the degree Celsius to Kelvin, change the change the liter of this to milliliter because our density is given in grams per milliliter grams per milliliter and then we find the masses of hydrogen peroxide and then we work that and then we find uh use that to find the volume so hence that's where our step-by-step -step proceedings is going to go from so we work that out given mass so density multiplied by volume is going to give us mass because your Ma your density is mass over volume and when you multiply volume to density you're going to get mass so we have our mass as one times 1.27 times 10 to the power of 3 which is typically your 1270 yeah 1270 grams so with that we can get our moles and our moles is basically equal to your mass over your molar mass the mass over your molar mass so the mass and the molar mass under because first and foremost what you're going to do is you're converting your grams you're trying to find your grams of oxygen given the fact that you have one mole of the oxygen present what well, that's um one mole of hydrogen peroxide and then you have the mass there because it's 
2 times 16 plus 2 which is technically 2.0 something so that's how you that's the molar mass you have there of hydrogen peroxide so what you're trying to do is you're trying to get that and then get that of oxygen in the in the in turn and you know the mole of oxygen there is is one over two moles of the hydrogen peroxide um where we got all these moles is from the reaction here it's from the reaction here because you have two moles of hydrogen peroxide producing one mole of oxygen so that's that's the basis for this here this this part here that i'm trying to go well, that's the basis for this part so once you do that you have 18.7 mole and given the fact that you have 18.7 mole you put it into the equation to find volume and the equation 18.7 mole is going to multiply by the gas constant multiply by the temperature which you have converted already to Kelvin, and then you're going to divide it by the pressure and then you have your volume as 576 liters 576 liters of which that's a lot of liters the mass also explains it because from the mass we have of hydrogen peroxide you can tell that you need a big a big volume to carry that so we look at what we call electrolysis i don't know how many of you are conversant with what is electrolysis but the word electrolysis simply means splitting of electrons of water so when this happens notice that you have a battery here you have your cathode and anode and you have a test tube inverted so what happens is that the water actually will split into respective um, Split, split into respective um, parts so what you have here is oxygen and what you have here is hydrogen so oxygen is going to be here and hydrogen is going to be here so the cathode and the anode you have movement so hydrogen is what you have here and oxygen is what you have here so basically as a result of electricity cathode anode one moves to the other side the other one moves to the other side and basically that's what happens here and then you have the splitting on the basis of charges because um, the negative part will have the positive come true and the positive part will have the negative come true and that is how it works with electrolysis so that's it in a nutshell for that so we now quickly go to gas mixtures partial pressure and mole fraction and this is just dealing with mixtures you remember we talked about gases alone now we're now talking about them when they are in a mix we did that initially when we talk about the atmospheric pressure of uh, the normal atmospheric pressure and then we compare atmospheric pressure to the pressure of a gas so in this case now we're talking about gas mixtures so ideal gas law applies to all gases so it applies to all mixtures of gases as well so all gases and all mixture of gases so it's what we call partial pressure so part of the total pressure due to each gas in the mixture so the pressure is partial because when you have several mixture of gases you know that the pressure is not total pressure is partial because you have this gas exerting its own pressure the other gas exerting its own pressure so hence you use the word partial pressure then the sum of the partial pressure is what we call the total pressure because if this part is exerting pressure this part is exerting pressure the total is what we call the total pressure so think about it if you have like two three different gases or take for example water and oil in a bottle do i say the pressure of water alone no i have to include the pressure of oil as well so hence water is exerting this pressure oil is exerting its own pressure the total is what we call the total pressure so we have the dalton's law of partial pressure so dalton came up with the law of partial pressure so in his law it says the total pressure of gas of a gas mixture is the sum of the partial pressure of the gases in the mixture which is straightforward so consider a mixture of hydrogen and helium so the hydrogen gas is h2 remember we saw hydrogen gas being produced from that hydrolysis um, reaction that we saw there and then helium gas as well so the total pressure will obviously be the addition of the pressure from hydrogen plus the pressure from helium which will give you the total that we see down there so if you add one two um if you add it like this just so that for those of us that probably just six plus nine 
15, 1, 11, this is 6 plus 5, 10 plus the 1, 11, and then this plus this is 5 plus the 1, 6. So that's how it goes. And then you have wet gases, partial pressure of water. So you can have pressure, we have um, gases in liquid. You can have gases in liquid, by the way. Those gases are formed in the liquid media because water is the media by which the gases were used to form the electricity, electric currents were just used to create that. Um, and the test tubes too are there to collect the gas because normally if the test tube were in there or if there was no water, you will not see the test tube being collected because gas will go up and the water will come down. So I think we'll see that in the next slide to, to confirm what exactly it is that I said from that electrolysis. So the pressure of water is the, pre the pressure of water is the pressure is the pressure of, the pressure of water is actually the vapor pressure of water. So the pH two is the pressure vapor pressure of water. So the um, the pressure of water is dependent on temperature. This is very much important that you understand that in your kitchen when you're boiling your water, the moment the pressure increase the temperature increases. The moment the temperature increases, the moment the temperature increases, notice that the pressure increases. The pressure increases. So notice that it's different for volume. So volume is inversely proportional to pressure. Well, notice that you have an increase in pressure, temperature, and increases pressure. So that's why the pot would almost want to pop out and all of those things. So consider the hydrogen gas collected by bubble through water. So your total pressure is equal to the pressure of water plus the pressure of hydrogen gas. So partial pressure of water vapor is H2 is equal to the vapor pressure of liquid water. So you have um, vapor water and liquid water. Notice that all those things are just the water normally and then the vapor from the water because water vapor the water vapor has good amount of pressure. In fact, steam engines, um, they move on the basis of the energy that is generated by the vapor. A lot of things as well. So, vapor pressure of a substance is the pressure of the gaseous form of that substance. So, we know what vapor is. Vapor is, gas, vapor is gas, liquid is liquid. So, the vapor pressure is the pressure of gaseous form of a substance. Notice that when you boil water, vapor is what results in when it's boiling. So you have all those things that call your intensive properties and they are dependent and it depends on temperature. Because increase in temperature is what results in vapor formation and hence vapor pressure ensues. So in this place you have um, gas collection which is done by upward movement and downward displacement of air. So what you see in the beaker is a reaction that results in the production of a gas and hence you have a situation where this tube is linked into this place where what happens is that the volume of water goes down and then the gas occupies the stop as you see in the next part. So what you see here is that the water goes down and the gas is collected here. So you have the gas collected here and then the water. Notice the change in volume. The water now was here. All of a sudden the water has increased to this point because this space now is now occupied by gas and water was displaced. So that's what we call displacement of water and replacement of air. So we have... Um, Another example, which is our final example there about a student prepares a sample of hydrogen gas by electrolyzing water at 25 degrees Celsius. She collects 152 ml of hydrogen gas at a pressure of 70, 758 millimeter mercury. Using the appendix one, which is appendix one, find the vapor pressure of water at 25 degrees Celsius and then calculate the partial pressure of hydrogen and the second question which is the B part is the number of moles of hydrogen collected so how we're going to do this we use what we're given 
which is your volume of hydrogen gas, pressure in millimeter mercury, and temperature in degrees Celsius. Note that we're going to do conversions back and front on the strength of that. So we'll swing it to action. The information is given. We're asked to have the number of moles of hydrogen gas and pressure. So we have to recollect some things from the past. And Dalton's law means you have to add all the pressures together to have one pressure. And then we use the ideal gas law to work out the moles. So given that, we'll swing into action. We add the two together and we get the the pressure of we said we get the, the um what called the vapor pressure of water from the appendix that's where we get the we get the vapor pressure from the appendix that's what you have here the vapor pressure here is what you have here so to have the total we have that of um to work out the total or that, that of hydrogen we have to minus it from the total hence we get this minus it from the total and then we, we have that of hydrogen because this is total which is what we gave which we're given the question let me go back so that we see this is the total pressure and then we find the vapor pressure of water and then we minus it we minus the vapor pressure of water from the total to find the pressure of hydrogen gas. And once we find the pressure of hydrogen gas, we use the ideal gas law and then we'll find number of moles. And which just means we put in the the pressure of the, the um, pressure of the gas and the volume, the gas constant and the temperature. Just multiply them through. Notice that what is done here is conversion to ATM. This whole thing here is just directly converting it to ATM, which is just by dividing it by 760. And if you multiply by one, it's the same thing. So it converts it to an ATM. So at the end of the day, what you have here is 0 0.00600 moles. So that's your answer. And that is for that. So we now look at partial pressure and mole fraction. So pay attention to this because this gets a little bit tricky if you're not following. So notice that one mole, we arrange an ideal gas law for a mixture containing gases A and B. So now your pressure, remember we said is kind of directly proportional to your moles. If you remember the first, oh no, not. It was volume directly proportional to volume directly proportional to 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 moles. That was the first point. In this case, notice that your pressure, partial pressure, most especially, you have your partial pressure equal to your moles. Hence, you have your partial over your total, your um, moles over your total as well. Total number of moles. So, notice that if you cross it which means that your your the moles of a over the total moles is referred to as the mole fraction of a in particular hence if you have to play around with the formula we'll see what we uh, we'll see that pa equal to this downstairs where your moles the moles of a over the total moles is your x a and then the partial pressure of the A is a fraction of this, which is just basically you having XA multiplied by the total pressure, which will give you your pressure of A. I hope that it's not too confusing because you have your mole of A and then your total mole, which was now denoted XA. Your XA is just the mole fraction. And then for you to have your PA, which is your pressure of A, as formula it has to now be equal to you take this and multiply it through to this and then you have your xa equals to p total that is the total pressure of which this xa is just this here so i hope it makes sense it's just this here so it's just your mole fraction it's your mole fraction and then once you multiply this through you have this so that's it for that and that's your mole fraction partial pressure mole fraction just the relationship between the two so hence, if you're given any question with regards to mole fraction, 
this is the formula they can just tell you okay this is the mode or this is the total mode and we're looking for the total pressure or we're looking for the pressure of a so that's it for this so at the end of this lecture you're able to combat between pressure volume temperature and amount of the gas you're able to use the ideal gas law to solve initial and final state problems and you're able to calculate for either your pressure when the rest are given or for volume when the rest are given or for temperature when the rest are given or for the amount when the rest are given as well and then you have also learned how to calculate density and also sort the relationship between density and the molar mass or density and the mole and then also you have your you have to you also saw to relate amounts and volumes and gas reactions and then we saw the use of gas law where we talked about partial pressures and then the partial pressure and then the mole fraction which we just saw just now so that's it for the lectures on gases finished we're done with that look forward to your um, quiz 3 and also even quiz 4 on the 29th quiz 3 is going to happen on the 22nd of this month December 2020 and then the 29th of December is going to be a quiz 4 so prepare and look forward to that so this is me signing out for this part and see you guys in the next lecture thank you bye for now